on it, right? Right. Yes, people. Welcome back to Process. Today we're joined by another guest, Ethan Hamilton. Welcome to the podcast, mate. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Um, no worries, mate. I was going to say, just briefly intro yourself for anybody who doesn't know who you are. Tell a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, I'm Ethan Hamilton. I'm that in your old. Um, and I'm a racing driver from North Allerton. Um Raced in all sorts of different car racing championships like British Touring Car and Clio Cup. Yeah. Aye. So it'll be interesting just to hear about, like, but to be fair, your mindset and everything. Because I meant, I said before, before our camera, that I've been in the car racing with you and I do not know how you do it. So we'll get onto that down the line anyway. We're both struggling a little bit over here, a bit over here for you, so we've both got our tissues at the ready. If I put this on yeah. YouTube, people can see it. But to start off with, like, briefly, I want to talk about what you've been doing during lockdown. Like, cause are you allowed to go out and, and race on the track and stuff at the minute through lockdown, or do you have to kind of adapt and do something else? No, nah, so all the tracks have been shut right through lockdown. So to be fair, everyone's been sort of in the same boat, not really much to do, but yeah. there's... Um, a lot of simulator racing been going on so everyone sort of well who's got a simulator or if they haven't got one they've been buying them um and then everyone's sort of like come together and done different all sorts of different simulator racing championships so there's there's loads of different things that's been going on to sort of keep people keep people in the rhythm of it and uh yeah. and have something to do yeah how realistic is the simulator is it pretty pretty real compared to driving it, yeah it's not far off to be fair because like the tracks and everything else it's sort of it is like you could practice on there and then go to the track and relate to different stuff but like some of the cars like a lot of them are, like developed by actual drivers so they tend to feel like more like the real thing yeah, yeah. Um, but it is good just to keep like when you're doing like a 20 minute race just to keep the concentration for 20 minutes and yeah like well keeping the racecraft going and just everything like that that you would do in a real car but just on a simulator uh -huh. yeah I was going to say it'd be good to kind of keep your eye in because I, I don't know what you would do for, if you couldn't do anything for like that long apart from like playing your Xbox or something like that it's probably not the same doing that <laughs> keeping yeah. your eye on the Xbox for 20 minutes but no nah, that's good <laughs> uh, so just to start with it'd be interesting to talk about kind of how you got into it uh, well, like any sort of race car drivers, I don't know how your your career quote unquote started from when you were like a young lad. Like you still are a young lad, but right back when it when everything first kind of started for you. Yeah, everything sort of started when I was oh, probably seven, seven or eight. I actually got a fifty cc motorbike and yeah. just used to drag that round the field. And then uh, I think, well, my dad used to do karting. And I think when I was maybe eight or nine, I got my first go kart, and we just used to go up to one Lawrence Sunderland and just do do a bit of practicing and that, and uh, just for a bit of fun, really, just for a bit of, bit of a laugh with me and dad on a on a Sunday, just in the summer when it's nice there. Um, and then at the same time, I was playing football, so it was sort of like just a a summer thing. Um, and then as the years went on, I think probably 2011, 2012, um, we started to find a little bit of pace. So we're like, oh, well, we might we might give this a go and uh, and try and do a race. So that ended up finding a go-kart that was like, a, well, it was a junior, but it, was, it wasn't a cadet, which is like for up to like 12-year-old, I think, or 13-year-old. Um, and then we got that and we started testing on that and then, did some practice and then we thought, right, we'll uh, we'll enter the first race. But obviously it was just me and me and dad out the back of a work van <laughs> just on a little weekend. Yeah. How did, how did you do your first race? Did you do all right? Well I'm, I'm not very well I don't think. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't exactly like naturally naturally gifted kind of thing if you didn't win like the first race. Yeah. I can't to be honest, I can't I can't even remember. Because it was it was mixed classes. There was like Three different classes in the in the uh, in the race that I was in. Yeah, but yeah, we just sort of, we just sort of built it up really, uh -huh. um, just from being a bit of fun to then a bit more a bit more serious. But we just did it for enjoyment. To be yeah, fair. But, 
That's, I think a lot of people get the stuff like through enjoyment sort of thing. I think that's the best way to go about it because when you enjoy yeah. it, you're just going to end up doing it long term. And I see there, uh, I said more, that must be the way most like Formula One drivers, touring car drivers get into yeah. it through like go karting. Is that like the kind of standard sort of thing when you're a young lad to go go karting and then it just progresses from there? Yeah, it's really like some people you can start racing cars when you're 14, but a lot of people just they'll go through the karting ranks and then they'll sort of get to a point where it's like, do I keep just going with karting or do I then move to cars? Because a lot of people move when they're like 15 or 16. Yeah. Just, it's just so much more different and a lot of door, a lot more doors open. So I think karting's probably more common than the actual car racing at like yeah. high level when uh-huh. you compare the most. So you can you can drive actual cars at 14 years old, if like, but only for racing, but you can't drive yeah. them legally on the road. That, that, that baffles me, that. Yeah, no. that's crazy. So, when did you first drive a car? That'd be interesting. Fifteen. Yeah. Um, but my first race, I was actually sixteen. But yeah. So, so you hadn't even passed your test. No. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> that. Did you pick it up? No, no. Did you feel? Did you feel like you picked it up? In fact, that that's an interesting question. How um, how many times did it take for you to pass your driving test? Uh, once. First time, <laughs> can you remember what you got? Like minors and stuff like that. Yeah, I got 30 minors. I remember 30 looking minors. Yeah. Probably because you just at weren't thinking about it. You were just like, oh, this is just easy, this. I know. Not checking. I I thought, when I saw 13 on the sheet, I was like, I've definitely failed this. Yeah. And then I was, when you said you passed, I was like, what? Yeah, because it's 14 and is it fail, is it? Or any more than 14, yeah. I remember. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, he just goes well, I Googled it after because I was like, what the? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. So, obviously, you did your go kart and stuff. So, you said it was 50 when you kind of started doing your car racing. How did you kind of get in, into the two-run car and how did it progress from there? Yes, uh, I did like, I did two years in the uh, Junior Slim Car Championship, which is little 1.6 Citroen Saxos. That's yeah. what you can do when you're 14. Um, and that was like that was crazy because like I was 16 when I first started but there were some lads who were like 14 doing it and they just looked like like yeah. I mean I probably look young but I mean like some yeah. of them were like really, really small and just like it's just like how the hell can you even drive that car yeah. um, and I did that for a couple of years um, and then I did what was after that it was oh yeah the Junior Cleo Cup which is what I took you out in. Yeah. But that was the senior one. Uh-huh. Um, after that, I did VW Cup, which is Volkswagen Golf R's, um, a series with like Sirocco's and all different golfs and stuff like that. Um, and then Clio Cup. And then, but before Clio Cup, after the VWs, um, we were at, I think it was Rockingham Racetrack. And uh, Tony Gillenby on Team Hard said that he had a seat available in the in the touring car for the last two rounds if he wanted to do it. So we were a bit like, well, it's sort of a one in a lifetime opportunity, really. Yeah. Um, so we ended up sort of saying like, yeah, well, we'll, we'll obviously really want to do it. So we went ahead with it, and that was back end of 2018. Yeah, how did you do in that race? Um, first race, I was somewhat like 29th out of 32. Yeah. And then race two was a pretty good one, actually. It was 20th. Yeah, 20th out of 32, which yeah. I was pretty pleased with. Cause, yeah. Like, so, say, so how old were you then compared to like, what was it, what's the average age of like the racing driver that you were compare, uh, competing against? Yeah, I think average age, probably... Oh, We've got like Jason Plato who would be like fifty odd, but then I think the youngest at the time was about twenty four when I was seventeen. Oh, it's a bit off. Did you yeah. get any? Did you get any like funny looks off anybody? Like I put it in my notes just about like like other drivers who are a little bit more older and experienced. Looking like who's this kid? He's probably like he just drives around with his boy, boy racer sort of thing. And he's, he's turned <laughs> up here. And he's a decent driver sort of thing. Did you kind of did you get that sort of um, perception from people early on? Yeah. I think you do because people are a bit like, it's like, who are you? If you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And like, I think because of my age and stuff as well, like, 
I know there's some people like put a few comments on the Facebook. There was, a, there was like a few negative ones which were just saying like who like who is he and basically just stuff like that really. But I sort of just went into it with a man that like I've not really got anything to lose and like this this is an opportunity to sort of get my name out there and uh, and like progress for future if you know what I mean. But yeah, definitely I did get a few sort of. Funny looks, if you like, yeah. really. Yeah, well, it's probably it, it probably is expected. But how did how did you deal with those negative comments? Of, like to start with, did it, did it like get to your head a little bit, or did you just kind of just forget about them? It did at first, but then sort of there was like at the same time there was a lot more people who were like supportive of it. If you know what I mean, so yeah. it was still obviously not great to see. But I think there's a well. There's a lot of things that go on the social media, even with the racing now. Like, there's a couple of drivers in there now that a lot of people have got sort of negative comments towards, and right. I don't necessarily agree with that because I think it's like I don't really think you need it, and especially like if you're going in to do something like that, it's not it's not ideal anyway. Yeah. But, no, to be fair, I sort of I just I don't know really. I think I just sort of got over it and just thought, do you know what, like. Let's go and prove them wrong, if you know what I mean. Uh huh. Yeah. So it made me a bit more determined. Yeah, it's a good mindset to have that, to be fair, because I think a lot of you lads, especially if they're going into a spot like that and start getting something that comes, they probably might go on the shell, then it might affect the performance, which obviously didn't really for you, um, which is it's kind of good to see in terms of your mindset. So, starting, like, remember that first race that you, had, you were just talking about there? We, do you get quite nervous and stuff before going into races like that? Or were you nervous before that first one? Yeah, I was, that was a <laughs> terrifying. One. Jesus, <laughs> I uh, I'd come onto the onto the grid. I think it was my first race. What they do is the the cars are on air jacks, so you go out the pits, you do like an out lap and warm your front tires, and then when you park on the grid, they put the uh, they put the air bottle into the car, and the car like pops up because um, it's got some like little shoots that come out the bottom, which which obviously jack it up. And uh, one of the front jacks wasn't working, so my, I had to run with cold rear tyres to start with. Yeah. And uh, I was like, oh, my God, this is my first race. And yeah. I've got cold rear tyres. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I just remember, like, the the whole noise and everything just when you're on the grid. Because you've got earphones in, but it's, like, it's so, like, loud. And... Uh, yeah, I was. I was. I must admit, I was nervous and like, yeah. That that first that first time, just like how the car starts off the start line and everything like that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was pretty nerve wracking. Yeah, I can imagine. So, what's it? What's it like? What's it the feel like before you kind of like? Obviously, the the lights go green, kind of thing. What What's the things that are going through your head at that moment? Just like, right. I need to get off to a good start. Like, are my tyres warm enough? Like, where am I going to go at the first corner? Because, mm-hmm. like, every race is, is different as well. So, yeah, I, yeah, there's there, there's a lot of things that go through your mind. I think you just sort of, you just got to, like, focus on the lights and just get a good start and then just get your head down, really. Yeah, yeah. You kind of forget about it as soon as you get into it. Yeah, you do, really, because you, you're, like, thinking about others around you all the time. So, it sort of just, like, simmers away. I was going to say, you can't really think about anything else when you're driving at the speeds and stuff that you go, because you're, you're probably just so focused on not, yeah. not crashing, which is something to talk about, actually. Do you ever think about it, like, before a big race or before any sort of race, like, crashing or anything like that? Not really. I, I think, like, I think if you worry about crashing, it'll have, like, a negative effect on your driving. Yeah. I think you've just got to have, like, the mindset of, like, if if something happens, something happens. Like you don't want to, you don't want to be reserved in your driving because you're worried about, you know, like crashing into something. Yeah. Like, because other, it just it could backfire. Uh-huh. But yeah, to be fair, it is when you do have a crash though, it's an absolute nightmare. Not yeah. only for me, for all the team who've got to bloody fix the thing. Yeah, I was gonna say if you had had a big one. Yeah, I did the last. Well, actually, when I was in the touring car, um, someone in a BMW sort of went a bit sideways in front of me. 
he sideswiped the lad who was next to him and then I was just coming round. And as he sort of like turned, the car was moving forwards, but towards mine as I was coming around the left-hand corner. And it just smashed into the side of the car and it like, it ripped the rear door off. Um, it broke like the front suspension and oh yeah, it was it was a serious accident. Were you all right? Were you fine? I was all right, yeah. It didn't look too bad. Like when I watched it back on the camera, it didn't look bad, but like in the car, it felt like it did feel like quite a big hit. Yeah. How fast were you going at the point when you hit him or he hit you? Probably 70 or 80. I can just imagine, I do think about that sometimes. Like, you know, I'm just driving down the motorway, I'm doing 70 miles an hour. I'm like, yeah. if I hit something now, like, that's that's me good, done. I'm done now. Like, <laughs> you're, just, you're just driving past, like, like, looking into the fields and you're passing things. Like, if I hit that now, like, that's me done. Like, I don't know how, <laughs> how you do deal with that mentally, knowing, like, you've probably, have you seen any really big crashes, like, in, in races oh. that you've been in, like, big ones? Yeah, yeah. Like, I remember. We were racing one weekend and someone had sent us a video of this crash that had happened at a different track. And yeah. this car literally barrel rolled three times into the pit lane. Um, and then this other car just went head on. It, it must have been doing, I don't know, maybe 80 or 90. Just like head on straight into the barrier. Yeah. It was a, it was a massive, massive crash. And it's like the, the Billy Monday thing, the, the lad who... Uh, unfortunately, lost his legs in Formula Four. Um, that was a yeah, that was a really bad crash. That was. Yeah. But like, he's done absolutely mega since then. He's he's ended up winning races in like F three and stuff since then. Oh, fair so, play, yeah. Then. But yeah, that's good going that. So in terms of like we're talking about mindset and stuff like that, how do you how do you have like do you do you feel like you build up the courage and the confidence to drive the way you do? Because like I said before, I've been in the car with you for a little bit. It was only like uh, what was it, twenty minutes or something like that? And you yeah, like I didn't, I didn't realize how close you get to each other. Like you literally like bump with the bump with people breaking before corners and stuff like that. How do you yeah. do you feel it, it took you time to get that confidence, or do you feel like you naturally just had it in you? Yeah, to be fair, I was sort of like I think. When I first started, I was sort of like, I was quite a like a late a late breaker. Like I just, I didn't really care if you know what I mean. I sort of yeah. just like went for it and just hammered it. Yeah, <laughs> which probably isn't such a good thing now because you need to be smooth. But I've sort of sort of learned a bit to be smooth, really. But yeah, yeah. like. I think I'll just i just use some bloody hammer it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you just you're just a natural nutter, and you just kind of got a bit better at it. That's all. Yeah. Really. That's, bit of technique. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy that because yeah. I, I always wondered like I think if I if I was doing that, I would be one of the kind of cautious drivers to start with. And I don't know if I'd just you'd get used to it over time. It's like you probably adapt to any sort of situation like that. You just get used yeah. to being so close to up front with someone. Uh so do you get have you ever like bump someone before do you get like point penalties and stuff like that for just bumping someone like that or not yeah you, you, I was going to say it must happen a lot if you are that close to people you must like at least clip them yeah oh, I'm trying to think of a I remember there was one time in Saxos where we were um, at Snetton and coming at the first corner there was a lad in front of me and he'd sort of like broke me at the corner and I didn't I sort of kept my foot in yeah. and I wasn't expecting to break and I tapped his rear and he sort of like went pirouetting off and smashed into the side barrier but his car was like wrecked both windows were smashed what so was that your and, fault well I did get a penalty for it you did I don't yeah somehow I didn't <laughs> did you did you have his team on your case after the race like in your, in your pain oh, that's they got you did you yeah, we weren't best of friends after that one. <laughs> does it does it get quite like rowdy and stuff? Like if there's like something like that happens, or there's a disagreement between teams and stuff, does it get quite like is there any like fights or stuff like, that? like you know like you see footballers that like stand up to each other like, head to head? Does it ever get like that sort of thing? Yeah, not like not as in like scrapping like throwing bats at each other. Yeah, like, yeah. that people do off words. Like you, you'll get out of your car and if. If you think like someone's done something bad, you know, you can get out and say like what you're doing is or something like that. But yeah, you know, I think if you 
if you punch someone or something like that, I think you'd just get a ban. Yeah, I was gonna say I'll never see it in like F1, I'll never see it like Lewis Hamilton get out his car and smack someone. I don't I don't know if it's ever happened. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't really follow the racing that much, so it might be wrong. There might have been someone who's been bad for it or whatever. But so talking about your your mindset in terms of racing, because how, how long are your races on average? Or do they kind of vary in length? Uh, so the races are usually twenty minutes plus one lap. Right. So it well, actually some track it will I think it does vary a little bit because of the track length but uh, usually it's 20 minutes plus one yeah so do you feel do you get quite tired doing it because to be fair actually one thing I remember I felt ill after going to the car you know at the start with like you go on the roller coaster I didn't feel too yeah. bad and then like, it got like the last five minutes so I was like wow this is actually getting to me do you ever does it ever, like, does fatigue set in and do you feel like physically tired by the end of the race, yeah. When I must like when I start to do touring cars, you have to do uh, like three hundred kilometers before you can do your first race in the car. Yeah, and uh, I was trying to do it in one day at Bronze Hatch, and like by the end of the day, my neck and like my back—I've never really felt that before. Yeah, because like the touring cars, completely different animal to anything I've sort of ever drove before, and it sort of. Towards the end of the day, like my neck and my arms, I could actually feel it. I was like, Jesus Christ, this, yeah. is, getting, this is getting a bit hard here. But in terms of like a 20 minute race, not, you'd, you've got like a, probably like a, sometimes you've got 12 hour gaps between races at least, or sometimes it can be two or three hours. So you've always got a bit of time to sort of like chill and like debrief and just sort of like, get yourself back together to go again. Yeah. So it's not, it's not too bad then, because I was going to say, talking about like physically, do you, do you have to do much physical training for Because I've seen, like, the likes of Lewis Hamlin's kind of, I've seen in terms of racing, he's went down the more like, focusing on his physique and focusing on training. So like, do you do much yourself? For anything? I know, yeah, I know well, we, we briefly done a little programme together sort of thing, so I know you've been doing a little bit of that, but did you do anything prior to that? Yeah, I, to be fair, I used to like go to the gym. I'd probably go two or three times a week, um, and I was well. Uh, I had a bit of a sort of meeting thing with Red Bull, and then that led to doing like some fitness stuff with Red Bull at their place, and they sort of sent me some different things that would help with my racing to do. Yeah, but they were more just like um, more just like like different stretches and stuff. It was more like a uh, I think they called it a body MOT, is it? Yeah, yeah. I don't know what you mean. Um, a lot more mobility focus rather than actual strength yeah, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you like, used to go in the gym a couple of times a week and that. Um, but then obviously when I got that program off you, yeah, that was sort of like, that was the first real thing I'd had to sort of give me a bit of structure when I'm actually in the gym. Yeah. Um, I... Like, I, think, I could actually, sorry, I could you carry on. Yeah, yeah. Like I could actually see like a difference if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. When you do get that like actual structured program and yet they kind of progress it over time, you that's when you will see the difference. And I think in terms of your driving, like, I don't like body weight's not going to be a massive factor unless you're like really, really ridiculously overweight. Yeah. So I, I think you'll be fine once you're down to a certain weight. You'll be fine. But I think more, it'll help you psychologically when you do come to do like the longer races as well so if you are doing like an hour workout maybe for example that's like then you can kind of record it that's when our race like keeping you keep your focus keeping yourself like if you've got the physical capability to to do a full hour workout without getting tired then it'll help you with your racing um, yeah yeah and i also think a lot of like do you, do you say because your neck your back got tired do your arms ever get quite tired doing like a lot the longer races that you're on about just because you're constantly your arms are constantly on the wheel obviously yeah. it's, it's high speeds and there's a lot of g-forces and stuff so i can imagine i mean it's a completely different story but i did there uh, i did go-karting last year for like, t like 20 minutes just like as you do like no go-karting and my grip, yeah. my grip was killing me I, by the end of my hands, like we just did a training session. Like I'm a goalkeeper. We just did a training session beforehand. Then we went as a team to do goal cut, but my hands were killing me. Do you ever find that? <laughs> yeah, especially in goal cutting because your hands are like vibrating. Vibrate. Like, That's what it was. Yeah. Like that, <laughs> and they're like, cats are lethal for that because 
they like get your back and everything. They do like yeah. They oh yeah, the. They're not nice things, and a lot of people wear like rib protectors to protect the ribs and that because you end up with like bruised ribs. And like you said, like your hands are just like, yeah, especially if you do a long distance when your hands just end up being like stuck in that position because they've been vibrating for that long. Uh, after, after like 10 minutes, I was like, I'm, this is like a workout now. I'm sweating, my forearms, my grip's gone, <laughs> my legs are hurting. And I wasn't, I was like, I'm, I'm done now. I looked at the time, I was like, another 10 minutes to go. Like, this is just this is just brutal, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was similar with like obviously two room car. I'm guessing it's a lot more kind of comfortable because you are in an actual car. Yeah, it's your arms still do it because they've got a sequential gearbox. So you like you're pulling on a stick. Yeah. Like backwards and forwards, um, and yeah, they are they are pretty physical. The touring car is the most physical thing I've ever drove. Yeah. Um, like the the mini that we'll we'll be racing this year that. That is, I thought that was quite physical to drive, and you've got to really focus because it just wants to bloody kill you. Like, it's yeah. the like you're driving a straight line that just moves about so much. Really? Yeah. I, I would have thought they would have designed it so it's quite good going straight line rather than going all over the place. Like, I complain that I'm driving like my dad's van and it's rearing off to the right. Never mind <laughs> driving it. I, I would have thought these racing cars would have been fine in the straight line. You could just chill, put your hand off the wheel, it would have been fine. I know you don't, so you don't, so but I don't know what it, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because it's not set up right or what, but yeah, Jesus, well, like, I hope it's set up right. Like, I want to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when we first we first got the car and the first day in it, and you wind the suspension off, so it just like it basically doesn't really do anything. And yeah. uh, Dad had forgot to unwind it, and I went out and I was like, "What the hell is this?" I I literally went around the first corner and I was like, Jesus Christ, is this what they're like? Like, a car was just moving about all yeah. over the place. And you put your foot down and it just, like, talks there from left to right. Yeah. So what do you do What do you do in them situations where you, you know something's wrong? Like, if you, you probably, you've probably been in mo- loads of situations like that where you know there's something, like, doesn't feel right with the car. But do you have like a limited amount of pit stops and stuff before you like per race? You not or did you do you literally just do a lap and then go straight back on the pit stop? Yeah, so like if something's wrong and like I can't, I can't carry on. Then I'd like go into the pits and they'd have a look at it. You you've not got like a limit on how many times you can come in. So like if if you have got damage, you either like choose to pull over and then someone will come and recover you, or. If you if you know you've got damage but you think the car's drivable, you can just sort of carry on because a lot of the time it's sort of worth it to finish the race so you get the points rather than yeah. like coming in the pits and then scoring zero because if it gets to the end of the season and you you like I don't know say a few points off being a place higher up or whatever, you'd be kicking yourself saying like why why did I not why didn't I like finish that you know just to get even get the small amount of points because. Consistency is just key, especially like as you as you move up and that because it's so close. It's if you are finishing sort of in the top five, in the top three, that's sort of where you want to be because it only takes one person to then have a bad race for you to sort of make up a bit of ground. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Have you been in a position where you've had like a bad race or maybe a few bad races and then you've kind of dropped a few points? Yeah, Cleo Cup. Um, we had quite a few just like just like stupid little things that would go wrong like um i remember first race at brands um it was like first race on the touring car package so like first race on the on like the tv and uh i'd got the tv camera for the first for the first race in my car so i had like the onboard oh, camera right yeah and uh i i, I was nervous like because, like, having the cover in the car. Yeah. And uh, I think I'd qualified third. And I was coming around on the warm-up lap, because, like, you have one warm-up lap before the race to just get your, get your tyres in because you're on slicks. Uh-huh. And I went off track. And the camera was in the car on the TV. And I come around, it was, like, the third corner. And uh, I threw it one way, I threw it the other, and I just lost the rear. And just, like, pirouetted off the track. And, what, the uh, what, what, what were the commentators saying on that? Did you, did you watch it back uh, and they say anything? Yeah, they were just like, oh, he's been, he's been way overly aggressive. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, honestly, I couldn't believe it. Like, first race, I remember getting back on the Sunday night watching it thinking, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. So, do you watch back all your races? <laughs> yeah. Watch the We usually back. get back at like midnight and then we'll have it on record. So, we just watch it when we get up. Yeah. I said, then most I was talking about how I didn't realize I forgot to ask you about great, obviously racing on TV and stuff like that. Does that kind of add an extra level of nerves going into them races? Yeah, I I think it does because like pe- people, well, if they do watch, people will be watching you, if you know yeah. what I mean? Like, and there's a lot of spectators at the races, like, you get like 40,000 people coming to watch and stuff. Uh-huh. So, there is like that added bit of bit of pressure on top as well like in a sack so you'd have like 10 people like coming to watch it was yeah it's not the same not the same thing really but yeah it does at first it was a bit like like with the, having the camera the first time and that was a bit nerve-wracking but i think now you've just sort of you've got to forget about it and just sort of get on with the yeah with the race and really uh-huh so talking about what about the bad races so you had a few kind of bad races where you went off and tried to survive that. How did you get yourself back into kind of a better form after that in the following races? Is there anything that you do like, I don't know, like ritual wise or something before races or do you, do you just kind of just turn up, get on with it and then you just kind of get yourself back into the swing of it? Yeah. So like if, if like I have a bad race, we'll always like, sort of have like a bit of a debrief we'll get the camera out of the car and then like sit and go through it and say like what you could do differently or like where where I made a mistake or where it went wrong and it's just quite good to like to go through that and talk about it you know just for like for in future situations you can relate to this one and then learn from it if you know what I mean yeah yeah that's a bit that's a like we used to do that football wise, the same sort of thing. You just yeah. always look back through your clips. As much as you don't want to look back through your clips and like know how because you don't had a really bad race or you might have made a mistake or something, and it's horrible yeah. when it comes because you know it's coming up, you know the mistake's coming up, you're yeah. like, ah yeah, I know, I don't <laughs> you don't like watching it, but it has to be done kind of thing, you do learn from it. Um, yeah. it's quite good that you literally as soon as you get back after the race, you kind of look at it straight away. Do you um well when I played like my time games is probably different in terms of adrenaline rush football compared to racing driving. But do you struggle to get to sleep after races? Or are you <laughs> not too bad? I'm usually pretty knackered because it's so yeah. like where you you're always like sort of on the move, if you know what I mean, like going backwards and forwards and it's like the whole lead up to the to the weekend and stuff, like because we prepare our own car, you've You've got all that to worry about before the race. It's not like you just turn up and drive. There's so many other things like you need to sort out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm usually pretty knackered. It's just straight, <laughs> straight <of bed>. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Everyone, everyone's partying in the trailer. Like mum and that, they all have drinks and stuff. And yeah. Like, they're all partying in the trailer on the back of the truck, and I'm just like flat out asleep watching bloody. Top gear or something. That's that's me, mate. I'm the same. Just get Netflix on, <laughs> sit in my bed and just chill yeah. off it. That's how it could be put me bomb for party and stuff like that. So I just want to talk touch on a little bit about obviously having success at su- such a young age. Do you feel that there was I don't know, there might have been a point where cause I know if you compare it to like football, I know a, a lot of young lads get contract young and they get a lot of money and they end up just you know, going out loads or they get to the head, they buy nice cars, they, or they, they, they end up kind of getting this big ego. Do you feel like there was ever a point where you feel like you could have went down that route or something or maybe someone's kind of said to you, or do you feel that you've kind of had a good little support network around you that they've kind of kept you grounded or you've kept yourself grounded? Because it's, it can see how easy it is that like you're a young lad and you've obviously had a lot of success and there's probably money that comes with it as well. Um, and yeah. It's just how you kind of dealt with that. Yeah, like, to be fair, it's the thing with racing, it's all about, like, sponsorships. So there's never a point where you feel like, like, yeah, I, like, I'm earning good money off this, like, I'm sorted or, like, you, you can't take your foot off the gas. Like, you've got, to, you've got to constantly be doing work to sort of make it happen, if you know what I mean. So uh-huh. you've got to keep, like, keep your head and and do what you can for the sponsors and stuff. So they want to come back so that you can then race and then try and progress to like back to touring cars. Yeah. And it's like, 
you've got a I think you've got to have like good relationships with the sponsors and stuff because they're so important for like moving forward. Mm-hmm. Like obviously, you'd, like your dad, not like Northern Floorcraft, they've always sponsored me through throughout like all all my racing, which has just been like absolutely mega. Because like if it weren't for people like your dad, like it wouldn't be possible. Yeah. To do what I do, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So you feel um, you need to you need to kind of keep yourself ground and just keep focused and literally just focus on the racing and the rest will come just because you need to keep everybody else is supporting you kind of both like on your side but also you kind of owe them a little bit of respect for what you do yeah yeah that's a good way like, there's I think racing is like 80% off track 20% on track yeah because the work that goes in behind the scenes is just like unreal like uh-huh. it's not just like turn up and drive you've got so many other things to sort out like before the season and stuff it's just it is, it's like having a job like, and like, well, like another job, if you know what I mean. Like, it takes up so much time. Yeah, so but it's, you, wor- it's worth it. Oh yeah, so I say you can tell you you love it and stuff. So, how big's your? How many members of like staff or like your crew sort of thing do you have in total? Excuse so, yourself, obviously. Yeah, so there's usually like we usually have two mechanics on the car, but we'll have like a driver, coach, and then like team manager and who will sort of, like, overlook everything and make, like, the setup changes. And then you'll have, like, a, a bit of a data guy who comes and then plugs into all the cars, gets all the data off from the drivers, and then you'll go and, like, have a bit of a debrief with the coach and the, and the uh, like, the data man, if you like. Um, so there's usually, oh, probably two on the car, maybe five people, two per yeah. car, but then you'll have two or three per car, and then you'll have, like, yeah. Your people in the background doing yeah. doing stuff like three or four people. Yeah, so that's probably like another little incentive because you've got all these other people who are working for you. It's very different when you're in like a team sport where you've got like other people to kind of rely on and stuff within your team. But you're literally, when it comes to down to the race, it's like it is literally just you. Obviously, the team help out with the car yeah. and stuff, but they're helping you so you can do the best possible. So I think. They probably like, that adds a little bit more pressure on you, but it also kind of makes you think like I need to get my head in gear. Like I can't let everybody else down, which I think's another good side of it. Do you feel that yeah. the the the, pr- the pressure's ever got quite intense at one point, and maybe like I don't know, everyone has a moment where they like crumble under pressure, or they maybe like lose it, or there might have been a kind of an off track sort of time where you've you've struggled with pressure. Uh, if there is any, it'd be good to kind of talk about it. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know because every every race is sort of different. You just sort, of, you. I think you've just got to take it as it comes, and then like, it's hard to prepare because you don't know what the situation's going to be. Uh-huh. But I think, yeah, you do feel under pressure because you've got sponsors who, like, obviously sponsoring you, and you need to put on a good job to do, like, well to. To promote them, but like you wanna you wanna go back to the sponsors and say, oh yeah, I've 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 had a win or I've had a second or I've had a third. Yeah. Um, so there is always that as well because it's like if I'm not performing, what's to stop them then going to sponsor someone else? Yeah. Uh huh. It's like you have like it's like, it's like like contracts in terms of football. Like you 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 need you need them kind of even if you get one year contracts, it's the same sort of thing for you. Like you need to keep performing. If it comes to the end of that contract here and you're not performing, teams are gonna like sponsors and stuff, and yeah. it's gonna be like, I'm off, this guy's winning, so I'm gonna go with this guy rather than you. And they're gonna benefit yeah. my my company or my brand or whatever it is a lot better. So there is yeah. a lot of there is a lot of pressure for you to keep on keep on performing. So respects to you to be fair. So in terms of moving forward. What's the plans? Well, to be fair, be interesting to hear about what's what's the plans in terms of racing, in terms of the lockdown rules and stuff. Do you think it's going to resume soon or not? Do you do you not really know yeah. too much? They've put a, a nice calendar out. The the touring cars are still doing ten races, but they've got a race weekend every weekend in August. All right, which is going to be pretty hectic because if good. you've got damage, you've not got long to fix it. Aye, uh, um, and then so, but the minis what we're doing this year, they've reduce it down to five rather uh-huh. than eight rounds so but I, they've not really said who can like sort of go but I'm hoping that you'll sort of be allowed 
like your family who come to support you. Mate, yeah. I don't think it's expensive, obviously, because like crowds and stuff. But yeah, yeah, I think it's like it's a lot better when you've got family there to support you because you can make a bit of a weekend of it as well, really. Yeah, no, it is a good deal because obviously I went for it was like a thingy day. What do you call it? Yeah, a practice day. So, yeah, that was pretty. It's pretty good. Like, we keep saying I need to come and get get to a race, but you, the, the races are always miles away. I know. But with the <laughs> here, the here, there, and everywhere. But it is a good, a good day out. Like um, they've just took cross off this year as well, which is an absolute. Other, nightmare, but uh, unfortunately, not everyone's from up north. Yeah, I know. Ever, ever, <laughs> I know. So never mind us. Doesn't doesn't matter about us. Do you think you'll ever transition into? And I don't know how much of a dip, but it probably is a big difference transferring from a touring car to F1. Is that a, like a, a common thing that you, you has happened kind of in the past with touring car drivers to have transitioned over? Not, not from touring cars, but a lot of the F1 drivers will sort of come up through Formula Four to Formula Three, which Formula Four runs on the same weekend as the touring cars. Yeah, I think like if you're gonna get up into F1, you need to be in single seaters. Rather yeah. than like a tin top car, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but there was a guy, um, Matt Blundell, he's called, who raced in the Audi S3 and touring cars. He used to race for McLaren and Ferrari, I think. Yeah. Um, he raced last year. He, got, he had title sponsorship off PHP. Oh, right. Uh, but it, yeah, I don't. I think there is a couple of a couple of people from years ago who like made it through to F one, um, but it's not it's not overly common. But yeah. I think to get into F one, it's bloody not easy. Yeah, I was gonna say because it's the top top, yeah. top level. It's probably it's like Premier League, isn't it? Sort of thing. Yeah. But it's just like, but again, like you said too, it was a complete. It's almost like a different sport in its sense. So. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask the ultimate question, will we see you in F1 one day? But we'll probably, probably stick to Q2 and car. Yeah. Stick to Q2 and car. Good stuff, right? We'll finish off with the last little Q&A bit because I know you need to get away for your, for your practice at half past. So three questions for you. The first one, I don't know if you've had a look at these. Uh, the first one is three people you'd like to invite round for coffee or for a dinner. Just three people you'd like to, like to speak with. Anybody past or present? Uh, Lewis Hamilton, I think. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I don't know about him because uh, he's a good driver, but I think he's a bit weird. Yeah, there's, uh, there's some there's a mixed opinions of him, but it'd be, yeah. it'd be an interesting one still to to talk to. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, he, yeah, Lewis Hamilton. Um, who else? Uh, Max Verstappen, who's F1 driver for Red Bull. Yeah. Um, who else? Trying to think. Um, probably Mark Webber, because he's sort of he's gone from F one to like into Porsches and yeah, you know, he's yeah. done like all sorts of different things. Yeah, but mate, so just be good to see. When I watched F one, like, I used to like cars quite a bit. Like a few years ago, he was one that I used to like. Yeah. He was at Red Bull. Was, was it Red Bull he was at? Yeah, yeah. He, he was, was at yeah. Red Bull. I remember yeah. that. I see, me, me knowledge isn't too bad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> next question is three people you'd want to train with. So this would be, obviously, it's like gym related. It could be because you used to play football. It could be football related. Um, anybody yeah. sort of that, that in that aspect? I think I'd, uh, I'd like to go for a gym session with a rock. Oh yeah, everybody, everybody <laughs> wants a gym session with a rock man. He's big, and he's like, I think it's called Iron Paradise. His gym, I can't remember what it's called now, but he's got his like own portable gyms, man. They look at you. Yeah, you can get them when he's on like movie sets. I think he gets them moved round for him. In, like, a big, in, like a big tent thing, it's mad. Like, he's some rock. size. Oh, he's big. It? He's a big lad. He's like six foot seven or something as well. I think. Is it? He's tall. Is yeah. Go on. Who's the other two? Uh, other two. Cristiano Ronaldo to yeah. see what his what his like routine is and how he goes about his training. Uh-huh. And probably an F one driver like Lewis Hamilton again just to see sort of what the differences are to what he does yeah. training wise for, for for obviously racing. Yeah, because I've seen he does it because he's he's sponsored by Puma now, so I've seen a few things from the Puma like YouTube or something that he his trainer and stuff. So he's kind of into it. 
Yeah. Uh, so it'll be interesting to hear about it. And then last question. One thing that you'd say to yourself five years ago. Uh, never give up, I think, probably. Yeah. Simple one, isn't it? Everyone should hear, listen to that one. To be fair, just don't give up. Especially if you've got a dream and you you, you enjoy doing it, just keep doing. Yeah. Keep doing it, even if it gets gets tough. But mate, yeah, that's been that's been great. Do you want to shout out your social medias where people can find you and shout out your racing team as well? Yeah, yeah. So my Instagram is Ethan Hamilton Racing. If you just type that in, it should come up. And uh, same on Facebook and Twitter. It's just Ethan Hamilton Racing. Um. Obviously, big shout out to uh, all my sponsors, including Northern Forecraft, obviously your dad's company. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's been uh, it's been great to be to be on and have a little chat. I know, I've enjoyed it. Mate, it's been good. Thank you very much. Cheers, yeah. mate. Cheers.